Hey, Gracie's. <laughs> Hello. Oh, wait, I forgot. Oh, shit. <laughs> Sorry. I really don't know what I'm doing. I'm just winging it. Um, this one. This one is called. I took. Hold on. Let me, let me get it so you guys can see it. There it is. Um. This one is called, I took a job as a fire lookout in the middle of the woods. I found a strange set of rules to follow the first night. It's a series, and usually, usually I avoid doing these. But, um, I did specifically ask for, like, suggestions. Let's see how long it is. No, it's not really that long. Okay. I took a job as a fire lookout in the middle of the woods. I found a strange set of rules to follow the first night by Squishy Cabbage. All one word. After my divorce, I had nothing. Wanting to start over, I had moved out to a crappy apartment in, the, in a new city, had no real job, no pets, and obviously no wife. No real connections to the rest of the world. I was just existing. I was constantly applying to any job I could find, and I landed a shitty job in a shitty cafe serving shitty coffee to shitty people. I was bored and miserable, and despite only recently relocating to another city, I needed a more drastic change. And now the jackpot was hit. Amidst all those random applications I'd submitted was one for a fire lookout in the middle of the woods. Woods? <laughs> woods. No prior experience needed. That's right, a fire lookout. Those people who live isolated in a 70-foot tower in the middle of the woods looking out for fires and narking on campers. That actually sounds like really fun. <laughs> I kind of want to be a fireman. Or not, not a fireman, a fire lookout. Despite all the weird applications I submitted, I remember filling this one out because I had found it odd as it stated the role was currently filled, but they were accepting applicants in case it suddenly becomes available. I remember thinking, weird, but going for it anyway. And now I've got the job. I got a phone call from a gruff sounding guy who told me the pay and that I'd be living in the tower until the end of summer, so around two months. He also told me it was imperative I start right away, providing me with directions and informing me that I would be starting tomorrow if I accept, which I did. So here's to a fresh start. That... <laughs> that kind of reminds me of... Okay, don't make fun of me. This reminds me of the B-movie. <laughs> okay, this reminds me of the B-movie at the, the part where they're like getting jobs and the guy at the, <laughs> at the desk is like, there's, there's one dead, another dead, another two dead, dead, dead. <laughs> That's what it reminds me of. Okay. <laughs> I've just parked my car in the furthest point it can possibly go, and now I'm going to have to hike to the tower. It's just past 8 a.m., and Mark, the guy who gave me the call, said the hike would take about four hours. So, I'm setting off now, expecting to be there for lunch. Mark assured me there would be a full stock of food at my tower, my new home, and that I'd be able to radio to the nearest tower where I'd receive the lowdown of how everything works. It's chilly for a summer morning, but I'm very excited by the hike, as the woods in these parts are known for their beauty and quiet atmosphere, something I've longed for. I've just arrived at the tower, just past 1pm. The hike was challenging, but easy to navigate as it, as it was well signposted and had a clear trail. The tower is much bigger than I thought it would be. I estimate it's around 100 feet tall, which is the hut on the top of the four stilts, a winding staircase around the outside leading up to it. Next to the tower, an outhouse and storage unit, which I'm guessing is where the food is stored. I'll explore later once I get into my hut and set my rucksack down. The stairs were a hell of a climb. A bit tired, but I'll get used to it. The hut is small, has a balcony all around the outside. Inside there's a bed, a big radio, a table with a map, some books, a toolbox, a smaller portable radio, a lamp, binoculars, and a flashlight. The sides of the hut were windows, so from the inside I could see the outstretched woods all around me. Creepy, but makes sense as I'm literally keeping an eye out for fires. I set my rucksack down and remembered what Mark had said about radioing the nearest tower for direction, so I did. Hello, is anybody there? I asked as I fumbled with the big radio. Hey, you're the new guy, aren't you? I'm Allison, a chirpy sounding woman replied to the static. I've been covering your part of the woods whilst you're making the journey here, but can't really see too far into it, so I'm glad you're here. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I'm the new guy, Oscar, I radioed back. Mark said you could give me the lowdown? I can. Well, you've already figured out how to work the radio, so that's a start. 
The toilets are at the bottom of the tower, so it's the food stock which gets topped up every week by Mark or his son. As for the actual job, it's a lot of looking around making sure nobody's camping at night when they shouldn't be, and making sure no fires are started. Allison went on. Also making sure the paths are all clear, but it's all in the handbook which should be on your desk. Give that a read. Bruce's name is really Oscar here. <laughs> Thanks, Allison. I'll give that a shot and get back to you, I enthusiastically replied. I'll radio if I have any questions. No response. Cool. She seems pleasant enough. I reached for the handbook and was flicking through it. It basically said everything she had just told me, just in more mumbo-jumbo technical terms, but I'll study it back to front to make sure I do a good job. As I flicked through, a piece of paper fell out of the handbook. It was lined paper, which had been handwritten in blue ink. The handwriting was messy, almost frantic. The paper read... Rules to avoid the smiling lady. 1. If you see a woman in the woods with a manic smile on her face, don't approach her or draw attention to yourself. Return to your tower. 2. If your radio goes off and it's anyone except your closest tower, don't answer it, no matter what you hear. 3. If you hear a woman crying between the hours of 1am to 4am, ignore it. 4. At night, always sleep with your lamp on. If it starts to flicker, quickly run to turn on your main light until morning. If your lamp flickers off completely before you do this, hide under your bed until morning. 5. At night, if you hear someone running up the stairs to your tower, also turn on the main light until morning. If you don't do this by the time she's at the top, it's too late. If you wake up and see the smiling woman, this is number 6. If you wake up and see the smiling woman staring at you through your window, hide under your covers and hold your breath. She will come into your hut and you will feel her breathing right above you as she is hovering over you. Do not breathe. This will only last a few seconds. Once you feel her leave, turn on the main light until morning. If you hear any scratching at any point, either on your hut or by the outhouse, turn off all radios and hide under your covers until the scratching stops. 8. If you are investigating a campfire at night and upon your arrival you hear a woman scream, run back to the tower as fast as you can. 9. If at any point you are returning to your tower and you notice someone else inside it, run. Do not stop running until you reach the next tower. Don't look back. She will be chasing you. That's kind of fucking scary. Do you mean I can't kiss the lady if she comes towards me? She'll run at me and call me a slur. Good night, dude, Allison radioed in as I was drifting off to my first night. I jolted out of sleep with a fright and hastily radioed back. Night, Allison. Thanks for the help today. My first day was done. After eating, I had explored the woods and become acquainted with the machete used for clearing paths, which was a great stress relief. I had also read up on some of the laws of the woods and further responsibilities of the job. Allison had popped up occasionally just to check in, but I never brought up the, real, the weird rules I found. By now, But now I was wide awake, probably from the fright I had gotten from the radio she gave me wishing me goodnight. I stood up out of bed and looked around me, seeing nothing but the forest. It was dark and creepy, but the darkness was a good thing, no fires. I knew that at night there were other watchers. Less were needed, as fire is much easier to spot at night, but it was still important that I knew what to do if it was me who spotted one. I was just about to hop back into bed when I heard a scratching noise. That's strange, but it's probably an animal down by the storage box, scratching trying to get in. Jumping into bed, tired after the first date, I reached down to turn my lamp off. Just as I do this, the scratching got faster, almost as if whatever is making it is getting excited. I move my hand away from the lamp switch, and the scratching slows. That's weird. What else is weird is that the scratching seems almost methodical. It has a rhythm to it. As suddenly, both my radios start to emit a high-pitched noise. What the fuck? Shitting myself, I hopped out of bed and turned off the portable radio. And just as I was fiddling with the big radio, I caught a glimpse of the list of rules I had seen earlier. There was something about scratching, wasn't there? Oh, shit. I'm not the superstitious type, but I ain't taking any chances, so I quickly grabbed the, li the list. Rule 7. If you hear any scratching at any point, either on your hut or by the outhouse, turn off all radios and hide under your covers until the scratching stops. Fuck. I turned off the big radio and jumped under my covers. What the fuck, man? I could still hear the scratching, but it sounded closer. It sounded like it had gone from being a distant noise to being right on the wooden door of my hut. It was weak now, as if whatever was making it was lightly dragging their fingernails across the doorframe. Me ain't moving. What the fuck is it? It's the next morning. I had eventually fallen asleep under the covers last night. The scratching had stopped, but I didn't move from my covers at all, eventually letting tiredness take over. 
Looking back, I feel kind of stupid. I'm in the woods. There's a fuck ton of animals and radios can pick up on all types of feedback. I guess it makes sense that the first night was the hardest, trying to adjust to living a hundred feet up, alone, in the middle of the woods. Ah well, I'm going to make the most of the day today. I'm sure the rest of the nights will be much less eventful. That was part one. Alright, this is part two. I can't stop thinking about that scratching noise last night. What was it? It has to be an animal, right? Fuck, I hope it's an animal. I'm also trying to not think about that list, but man, it's hard not to. I've brought it with me just in case, although I feel sort of silly doing it. But I bet it's a prank. It's only my second day and I'm already being pranked. My mind is racing around the place. Anyways, I'm currently on a patrol, just walking some of the routes and pathways, making sure nobody's camping in any of the openings. It's getting dark, so I think I'm going to head back. I'm just about to take a circle, uh, I'm just about to take a turn that will cir circle me back to my tower when I catch the glimpse of a campsite. Here we go, my first real task. Telling campers that they have to pack up and leave, this area is for hiking only. I head on over. The campsite has been set up in a large clearing in the trees. There's just a single reddish yellow tent and a dried out fire pit. Hello? I call out. You can't be camping here, it's for hiking only. Silence. No reply. I walk closer to the campsite, fearing towards the fire pit in case something jumps out of the tent at me. I'm such a wimp. I call out again. Hello? Is anyone there? Nothing. That's when I start to feel weird. Something didn't feel right. I can't explain it. It was just off. I'm sure whoever has this set up is just hiking and will be back, but it's already almost dark, which made me worry. Wait, there was a rule about this, I think. I took the list out of my pocket and quickly scanned it. Sure enough, rule 8. If you're investigating a campfire at night and upon your arrival you hear a woman scream, run back to the tower as fast as you can. Okay. Well, not okay, but okay. I've not heard a scream, it's just an empty campsite. There isn't even a live fire. I'll radio Allison. Allison, hey, there's a campsite here, but no fire. Uh, there's a camp- There's a campsite here, no fire, but no people either. What should I do? Whereabouts is it? Allison replied instantly. I gave her my coordinates after referring to the map, which I had used- Which I had to use my flashlight to view, as it was going to be complete darkness. Um... I got it. It's just on the edge of my zone. I'll head down there now. You just go back to your tower, okay? Allison responded. Right. You sure? I asked. Positive. Head back. Be safe. Okay, she's the pro. I'll radio her asking how it's going when I get back. I was I was about walking for about 30 minutes. I, I, I can tell this person's British. It's, for some reason, the way British people speak, it's hard for me. <laughs> It's hard for me to like read it. They they say things weird. <laughs> Almost back in my tower when I spotted a clear pathway that jutted off into the trees. Weird. I don't remember seeing that on the map. I thought the road I had, I thought the road I was on had no path leading off of it. Figuring I had missed it in the morning and that I, and that I'd check it out tomorrow, I trudged on back to my tower. Once back, I sat at my desk just staring at the rules. I hadn't asked Allison about them, and don't want to unless something else weird happens. Tonight wasn't even weird, I just found an empty campsite. No woman screamed like the rules warned. I've been sitting here reading the rules for about 20 minutes when my main radio goes off. Hey Oscar, I've dealt with a camper. He says he was taken a ship by some trees and wasn't aware he wasn't allowed to camp here, Allison explains. He must have been doing his business when he were by the site. I'm walking him to his car now, all good. Okay, thanks for dealing with that. Good night, I responded. Um, feeling bad she trekked all the way out there for that as I got into bed. I mean, it's her job. It's the next afternoon. Last night was fine, no issues. I'm feeling more safe and secure now, and I've left the list on my table today. I've spent the morning eating. A lot. I think my appetite is growing due to all the walking around. I've just been staring a lot out of the, out of the woods from my tower, which is calming. It's time for my late afternoon rounds to make sure nobody is camping, but first I'm going to check out that weird trail that ain't on any maps. I get to it quite quickly. It's relatively close, and sure enough, it's as clear a trail as any. It's as if it had been maintained just as well as the main ones. I trudge along it, not expecting much. It's a bit downhill, but not a hard walk. I've been walking for about five minutes, and I think I can see the end of the trail. And that's all I see, just an end. That's kind of shit. This leads to literally nothing, just a wall of trees. I'm just about to turn back when I see it. 
There's a small red handkerchief around the branch of a nearby tree. Interesting. I walk up to it, and just as I approach it, I see another one, slightly deeper in the woods, and behind that, another one. Oh fuck, am I about to be an idiot and walk right into a serial killer's trap by following these? Almost as if I want to prove myself I'm- prove to myself I'm not a wimp, I'm going to follow them. I have gone past five handkerchiefs, each plain red with no inscriptions or anything, and I'm about to reach another. The difference is that this one is on the ground, the rest were all on branches. Past this one, I can't see anymore. It's a bit annoying, sighing as I reach down to pick, the, pick up the last handkerchief to expect it, inspect it. What the fuck? This is tied around something, something wooden, kind of heavy. I heave it up. Dirt rises off a wooden door as it reveals a small bunker. This is fucking cool. It's literally about 10 feet deep and 10 feet wide, has a ladder on its wall by where the door was lifted. I shine my flashlight in and can see a sleeping bag on the floor below and a camera. That's it. I climb down the ladder. It was sturdy, felt like it had been crafted well. In fact, the whole bunker seems pretty clean for being an underground bunker. But there's literally just a sleeping bag in here and a camera with a charger plugged into the camera itself, but obviously not to any wall sockets as it's a fucking bunker. I pick the camera up and try to turn it on. It's dead. It's a relatively modern camera, has a screen to view pictures on one side which seems fine other than a slight crack. The main lens of the camera though has been smashed, looks like it's days of taking pictures of over. Are over. I'm charging this when I get back to my tower. You'll never fucking guess. The campsite from last night is back. Hell, it looks like it never left. It's exactly where I saw it last night. Has this guy come back thinking he could sneak to the exact same spot? I'm literally looking at the same reddish yellow tent in the same position. The only difference is that the campfire is lit this time around, which was the only other light provided other than for my flashlight. Annoyed, I figure I'll deal with this guy then radio house and the good news that I dealt with it myself. I march up to the tent and reach to pull back the cover. I don't care if I give him a fright, he shouldn't be here and he knows that. I pull the cover off. Wait, what? There's nothing in the tent. I mean nothing. No person, no sleeping bag, no rucksack, just dirt. The fire is burning strong behind me as I swivel around toward it, scanning the trees beyond its fiery glow. It feels like something is staring at me. I quickly kick the fire and pour what's left to my water on it to put it out. I am literally plunging myself into complete darkness right now. The fire is out, I'm keeping my flashlight pointed at the ground because I can't bear to look at the trees beyond the campfire, I'm still feeling uneasy. I reach to radio Alice. A blood-curdling scream pierces the silence, coming from the growth of trees just beyond the campfire. Holy shit. The scream is one that I could never have imagined. It's a scream of pure pain, pure rage. A dark figure bursts from the trees, screaming all the while, and starts to run at me. I only make out part of its silhouette before turning to run myself, but I noted the shape of a human. A woman, with long hair and arms flailing loosely by her side as she sprinted at me. That's fucking scary. That reminds me of that creepypasta that was like, um, a smiling man that was like dancing towards the dude. I'm running through the woods that I'm only just coming to learn, staying on the path I know leads back to my tower. She hadn't stopped screaming, still chasing me, the long, the long drawn out scream all I can hear piercing my thoughts. Making a sharp turn on the path, I start to scream myself, although I can't even hear mine over hers. I'm over halfway back to the tower. Do I look back? Holy fuck, I can't. It'll slow me down. What the fuck? The scream is getting louder. She's fucking gaining on me. How the fuck is she still screaming? The tower. I see the dim glow from the lamp I had left on the hut above. I looked on in the hut above, breaching the darkness ahead of me, providing me with hope. I reach the stairs, bolting up them at full speed. The windy staircase is sort of uneven, so I'm stumbling every few steps, but I've yet to lose my balance. Halfway up, I hear her bolt onto the first few steps. She's fast, I can hear it. She's gaining on me, but I think I can make it. I'm at the top. I run into my hut, and as I slam the door, the scream suddenly stopped. I'm wedged up against the door, adrenaline pumping, holding my flashlight like a weapon ready to fight. The sudden silence doesn't help. At least when she was screaming, I knew where she was. My ears are still ringing though, as I stayed heaved against the door. It's been an hour now since the screaming stopped, and since then I've not heard a sound. My adrenaline has died, but I'm still fucking terrified. 
I'm finally going to move from the door in Radio Allison, unable to speak before from the fear. If that's a prank, that's fucked up. Although, for my sake, I hope it is a prank. I flick the main radio on. Allison? I anxiously gasp. Allison fucking answer. After what felt like an hour's silence, but was probably only half a minute or so, I hear a croaky moan. That's not Allison, is it? Uh, I'm gonna do the grudge. I'm gonna do the grudge sound. <laughs> it was a woman's voice, sounded in pain. What if that freaky thing that chased me got to Allison? Just as I was about to respond to check up on her, the radio sounded again. What started as another moan got louder, turning into the st turning into a scream. It was the same fucking scream. The same scream that will haunt my dreams, tainting them in pain and anger. She was screaming through my radio. I slammed it off. Good morning, man. How'd you sleep? Allison sharped the next morning. Allison, I replied wearily for my lack of sleep the previous night. What the fuck is this list I found? What list? Allison radio back, radioed back. I explained everything that happened, from finding the list, to the scratching, to being chased by a crazy demon bitch last night. Allison sighed deeply, as if to say, here we go again. This has happened before. In fact, it happens to every person who gets assigned to your tower. Allison started, I don't know what to believe anymore. At first, I thought it was just people going crazy from the isolation. I mean, I've never seen anything. But after Harvey and you only after, what, four days? I don't know what to believe. Harvey, I replied. Who's Harvey? The guy before you. He lived in your tower for over a year, refused to ever go home or take a holiday, Allison continued. He was a tough guy, good with his hands. He always had a project going he, had, he always had a project going on. Sometimes toward the end, I wouldn't hear from him for days. I think he spent entire nights out of his tower. No idea where he went though. Towards the end, I asked. I wasn't letting that slide by. Yeah, he disappeared. Mark thinks he ran off. His tower was apparently just empty when he checked up on him. No bags, no belongings, no Harvey. But I don't know. Why would he just quit after a year of refusing to leave the woods at all? Allison continued, but in the months leading up to his disappearance, he became obsessed with a smiling lady. Claimed he would see her at night, but he never went into detail. If I questioned him, he would just stop replying. Like I said, he did like I said, he didn't talk to me much. Hmm, but him leaving didn't explain why the job advertisement stated the job may suddenly become available, so I questioned Allison on that. I don't know about that, she replied. I've been working here two years, and Mark still never tells me anything. And who worked here before Harvey, I pondered. Another guy, Rick, Allison said. He left a few days after I started, but he asked me once if I had seen a woman in the woods, a woman that smiles. I said no, thought nothing of it, thought he was weird. I, don't, I didn't feel content with the amount of information I was receiving, unsure if she genuinely doesn't know much or is hiding something. So I decided to ask her. What made you take this job? Well, fuck me, I guess we're opening up to each other this morning, are we? Allison nervously chuckled. I didn't reply, waiting for her to answer my question. My sister, she went missing. In these woods, Allison said, voice trembling. It was right before I started. I took the job to, I don't know, try to find her? Or try to help others who might get lost. I don't know. I'm sorry about your sister, Allison. I felt bad for asking. That's courageous of you, though. I'm not going to ask any more questions. Not yet. I'm not sure how much she's actually telling me, but at the moment, it feels like she's my ally, and I want to keep it that way. I thank her for talking to me. I trust her, I think. I feel a bit more at ease, although I'm not sure why. Harvey apparently just disappeared, and both he and Rick claim to have seen the smiling lady. Was that the lady that chased me last night? The camera I had found was now charged up. It's evening, I still haven't slept. Not really moved. I've just been trying to make sense of all the information Allison gave me, but I can't. Maybe the camera will provide some answers. It flickers on. On the screen, three choices. Photo, gallery, settings. I chose gallery. The first few photos aren't exciting. 
There's a few pictures of a random lake, a random house, a random car, nothing that helps me. Flicking through them at such a fast pace, I almost didn't realize I'd skimmed over a picture of the tower. My tower. And at the base of the tower, a family. A family of three. The father has dark hair, quite tall, and looks as if he's experienced with the outdoors. Big, sturdy guy. The mother, a blonde woman with a beautiful smile, her arm on her husband's shoulder. The third member is a child, a boy with short brown hair and a striking resemblance to who I guess to be his father. I continue to look through the photos, but no longer see the family together, only the man. He was taking selfies inside my tower, taking photos of the view from my window, the outhouse, and of some of the trails. Is this Harvey? Or Rick? If it were Harvey, why would he not want to leave the woods to see his family? Then, the photos got stranger. The next photo is of a bunker. THE bunker. The one I found nearby, built into the ground holding only the sleeping bag and this camera. It looks unfinished, a work in progress. With each picture, it looked more complete. Whoever had this camera was building it. Allison said Harvey was good with his hands, didn't she? Why would he build a bunker in the woods, and so close to the tower? The next photo of a random tree in the darkness. In fact, the next four or five photos are of this tree. At the base of the tree, a shadow. A weird, distorted shadow. A shadow that doesn't make sense. Was Harvey, or whoever this guy is, trying to take a photo of something? Was he trying to take a photo of the smiling lady? What the fuck was that noise? What time is it? 2.13am. Something just woke me up. I can't hear anything now, but something definitely woke me up. I was so tired from the night before that I wouldn't have just woken up on my own accord. Maybe it's a... I hear faint crying. A woman's cry. I can't hear anything now, but something definitely woke me up. I was so tired from the night before that I wouldn't have just woken up on my own accord. Maybe it's a... I hear faint crying. A woman's cry. It doesn't sound too close, but I sat up in bed as I listened to the long, mournful wails. I know this rule. Rule 3. If you hear a woman crying between the hours of 1am to 4am, ignore it. Except, I can't ignore it. It sounds so sad, so broken. Part of me wants to go and help her. The other part of me uh, wants to investigate and get answers. No part of me wants to ignore it. Quietly as I can, I slot on my gear, grab my flashlight and radio, and open the door to my hut. I carefully went down the stairs, shining the light at my feet to ensure I don't trip. The crying is coming from an area of the woods off the path, so I carefully tread towards the dark cluster of trees. DON'T! Dude! This is so stupid. The cries are of such pain, such sadness. I can only compare them to that of a mother who has lost her child, wailing in complete despair, losing a part of her soul with every agonizing sob. My flashlight is off now, as the crying is getting louder. I'm crouched down, moving bush to bush, tree to tree. The air is foggy, cold, getting colder the closer I get. As I crouch behind a tree, I see her. She sat down by a tree, her face covered, crying into her hands. She is side on to me, and has long dark hair which sprawls down her back and rests in the dirt. Although I can't see it too clearly, she wears a gown, which seems clean and undamaged. What is damaged, though, are her arms. Her arms are twisted, broken. One of her elbows is bent backwards, with bone jutting out under the skin from both her forearms, although not piercing through. Her fingernails, long, sharp, not an ounce of meat on her, her body almost skeletal. Her pale white skin glowing in the darkness, hugging her collarbone, accentuating her bony figure. My radio statics, only for a second. I quickly look down to turn it off, and as I do, I realize. The crying has stopped. I'm still looking down at my radio. She heard me. I can't look up, I feel sick. I force myself and slowly look up at her. She's looking at me. She has hollow, dark, wide eyes. They look lifeless, the whites of her eyes providing a drastic contrast to her dark pupils. Her eyebrows are raised. She's smiling. Her smile is unnaturally wide, spreading across her face wider than what should have been possible. Bearing all her teeth. Her smile so menacing, dark. 
on her face, remnants of the tears she had cried. Some tears still dripping off her sharp cheekbones and dripping down her narrow neck. Except she wasn't crying now. She looked excited. I'm about to run. I can't look away from her, but I'm c trying to convince myself to fucking run. I need to run. I've been staring at her for about half a minute, and she hasn't moved. Her eyes still locked with mine, her smile sinister. Just about- just as I'm about to muster the courage to turn my back on her and run, she moves. In one quick motion, her neck snaps to the side with a click, and she crawls into the darkness beyond her. The movement so fast, her broken arms cracking as she shot away. This is my chance. I turn to run. I run hard, don't look back. I'm dodging some trees, running into others, but not stopping. Why did she just leave me alone like that? Fuck, there's the tower. I run up the stairs, stumbling into my hut and slam the door. I hear nothing. In the safety of my hut, I'm looking around the base of the tower, the woods around me. I see nothing. Fuck it, I'm getting under my covers. I turn my lamp on and jump into bed. Shaking, I try to calm myself so that I can listen to my surroundings, listening out for her over my pounding heartbeat. But I hear nothing. There is nothing but silence. Just as I peep out from my covers, building up the courage to radio Allison, I see it. Scratch marks on the floor of my hut. Marks that weren't there before. Marks I must have missed when I raced in. They look like something made by an animal. Made by something crawling. The marks are from the door of my hut all the way across the room to my bed. I couldn't see her outside before because she was already inside the hut with me. She's under the bed. I'm fucking frozen. I know she's there. I can feel it. She's under my bed. What do I do? I think back to the rules. Was there anything about this? There are two rules that could help, but I don't know which one to follow. Rule 6. If you wake up and see the smiling woman staring at you through your window, hide under your covers and hold your breath. She will come into your hut, and you will feel her breathing right above you as if she is hovering over you. Do not breathe. This will only last a few seconds. Once you feel her leave, turn on the main light until morning. Or Rule 9. If at any point you are returning to your tower and you notice someone else inside it, run. Do not stop running until you reach the next tower. Don't look back. She will be chasing you. Do I hide under my covers until she leaves like in Rule 6? Or do I run because she's inside my tower like in Rule 9? She was already inside it when I entered, so that's Rule 9, right? I hear her. Not loud, but I hear her. The kind of sound made when someone is trying to move slowly whilst trying not to break the silence. The slightest shuffle. A second later, a slight cracking noise. Her arms. They're moving. With it, a low, stifled groan. I close my eyes. I need to make up my mind. Do I stay under my covers or run? Rule 6 or Rule 9? I feel the slightest tug at the bottom of my covers. It wasn't a hard tug and only lasted a second. Following this, a second tug, slightly harder than the last. I choose Rule 9. With an explosion of speed, I leap out of my bed and burst through the door as it slams behind me. I don't see her. I don't look. Luckily, I'm already in my shoes from earlier. I'm halfway down the tower, and I hear a bang above me, the door slamming as she leaves the hut. I'm at the bottom of my tower, and I hear steps above me. She's halfway down the tower. I'm running towards the path, and I hear the shuffle of dirt and grass behind me. She's at the bottom of my tower. I'm running towards the bunker, the noise behind me getting louder. She's catching up. She's on the path. I reach the bunker and quickly open it. I swing onto the ladder and shut the panel above me. I hear her. She's moving around above me on the wood and the grass around it. Her low moans freeze me, making my hair stand on end as she croaks in anguish. I'm in the corner of the bunker. I'm staring up toward the door but can't see it through the darkness. She's still above me. I hear her movements. They're a mix of fast, sudden jolts and slow, almost confused movements. Maybe she didn't see me go into the bunker. Maybe she doesn't even know about it. Or can she not get in? Is this where Harvey would spend his nights when he wasn't at the tower? Allison said she didn't know where he would spend some of his nights. Was it here? I can't hear any I can't hear anything now. It's been about twenty minutes. I think the creature above me has gone, but I'm done being an idiot. I'm staying here till morning. 
I eventually drift off to the calm sound of the wind caressing nearby trees. Dude. Okay. If, if this is Allison, I'm gonna fucking yell. So last night was too close. Looking back on my decision to investigate, I feel stupid. I'm not sure if it was for my lack of sleep or that she cast some fucked up spell on me, but I won't be making decisions like that again. I'm going to be a stickler to the rules. It's morning. I'm still in the bunker. I eventually built up the courage to lift the panel above me and peep out, blinded by the sunlight after being enshrouded in darkness for so long. All looks clear. Wary, I climb out and head to my tower. I'm quickly climbing the stairs to my tower when I hear a voice behind me. Hello. I shit myself, spinning around and almost falling off the side of the staircase. There's a girl at the base of my tower. A normal looking girl. She has brown hair, glasses, and is carrying a large rucksack. She's wearing hiking gear and is smiling at me. Sorry to scare you, she says. Hi, I'm Samantha. Sam. I'm still just staring at her, heart pounding. Mark's daughter, she explains, here to top up your food. Elsa had mentioned that Mark or his son would be here for that, no mention of a daughter. Oh, hey, I reply, voice shaking. Sorry, you scared me. I'm, uh, Oscar. Hey, Sam, she, re she reiterates, still smiling. Are you okay? I force a weak smile and nod. Just gave me a fright, that's all. I thought it was Mark or his son that tops this up. She laughs. It usually is. I've just kind of recently started helping out, I guess. You're actually my first stop today. It's nice to meet you, Oscar. It's getting dark now. I'm feeling determined to find out what's happening in these woods. Don't get me wrong, I'm scared shitless, but I'm done making bad choices. As far as I know, I could be on my own. I don't know who to trust. Allison, maybe? I'll need to see. Just before heading to bed, I radio her to ask her something. Hey, Allison, I say, does Mark have a daughter? Oscar, hey, Allison replies, only a minute later. I was about to radio you goodnight. I'm not too sure about that. I've only met his son. Why? Okay, I was just wondering. You okay, Oscar? Has something else happened? She asks. I'm fine, Allison. Good night. I'm still terrified, but I know what I need to do. These rules are my lifeline. They will keep me alive, so I need to follow them. I know that now more than ever. I'm keeping my shoes on when I sleep tonight, just in case. I decide as I turn on the lamp before switching off the main light. I had been lying in bed for about 30 minutes when I heard it. The scratching again. Rule 7. If you hear any scratching at any point, either on your hut or by the outhouse, turn off all radios and hide under your covers until the scratching stops. The scratching is faint. It sounds like it's coming from somewhere on the staircase, if not down below by the outhouse. Immediately, I rush to my big radio and switch it off. I check my small radio is off, which it is. I swiftly move back to my bed and get under the covers. The scratching continues. It gets louder. Each one is slow and long. Slong? <laughs> Each one is slow and long, <laughs> mimicking the sound of nails against a wooden board. Each scratch is followed by about 10 seconds of silence, then by another one that sounds closer than the last. Soon, the scratching feels as if it's right beside me, almost as if it's on the frame of my bed. I hold my breath and close my eyes. Not a rule, I'm just fucking terrified. The next scratch is longer than the rest. It's either on my bed frame or the door of my hut. I don't know, I can't think straight, but I'm not going to move. The scratching has stopped now for about 15 minutes. All I can hear is the rustling of the trees below, as the wind whips through them, creating an atmospheric whooshing right- creating an atmospheric whooshing sound right past my hut. I had already made the decision to stay under my covers for the remainder of the night, just in case, when I heard another sound. Faint footsteps. Each each fast thud increases in volume as I realize she was sprinting up the staircase. In my panic, I forget the rule. Instinctively, I jolt out of bed and run to my main light switch. I turn it on and the running immediately stops. I am frozen, standing by my light switch, waiting for something to happen, but nothing does. Trembling, I edge toward the list of rules which I kept beside my bed, pick it up, and check that I've done the right thing. Rule 5. If you hear someone running up the stairs to your tower, also turn on the main light until morning. If you don't do this by the time she's at the top, it's too late. Thank fuck. 
If I'd known that my main light was included in more than one of the rules, and I'm so relieved that I had chosen correctly. I'm looking around the balcony surrounding my tower, and I see nothing. I stare at the top of the staircase for what feels like an eternity, but nothing happens. Nothing comes up. The bright glow of the main light makes it impossible to see out into the surrounding woods below, I thought as I sat at my desk. It's been about two hours since she tried to run up my stairs, and there's no fucking way I'm going to be able to sleep tonight. So, I use my time wisely. I've been intensively reading the maps of the surrounding areas, learning the routes around my tower to the, like the back of my hand. However, I've also learned something new. I've managed to learn the route to the next closest tower. It's not too complicated. Whilst I still think I can trust Allison, I want to actually meet her. I want to see her for myself and talk freely, face to face, not hiding behind a radio. I've decided tomorrow I'm going to Allison's tower. I wake up early. I'm only on a few hours of sleep, but it'll do. In fact, I'm too driven to even notice. I pack a light backpack, some food, water, flashlight, radio, my map, and my machete. I also bring the camera to see if Allison can confirm if the man in the photos is actually Harvey. The sunlight is peering over the outstretched trees. I've never really taken in the beauty of the sunrise. I'm usually either asleep or scared shitless, but it was beautiful. I decide not to tell Allison I'm coming. Whilst I do feel a degree of trust, I don't want to warn her of my whereabouts, giving her a chance to change or alter anything just in case. I lace up my shoes and start the trek to Allison's tower. It should only take about three hours. The route was relatively direct, and judging from the map, I wouldn't have too many steep climbs or anything. I notice a stark difference as I ventured out of my zone and into Allison's. Each lookout has a zone. They are to maintain the paths and to deal with any issues that may arise with their zone. Each lookout has a zone. They are to maintain the paths and deal with any issues that may arise with their zone. However, as I made the transition into Allison's, I noticed that her paths were not well maintained. To be honest, they weren't maintained at all. Overgrown trees, bushes, and flora made me thankful I brought my machete as I hacked away and continued along the barely visible paths. It was tiring work, but I wanted to make sure the paths were clear enough to run through should I suddenly need. I was just losing motivation and starting to get hungry when I reached her tower. It had taken about five hours to the, due to the work I had to put in including the paths, but I'm here now. The tower is exactly like mine, the same layout with the hut on top of the four stilts, huddled within a small opening in the woods. Her house was on the opposite side, but her food bank was in an identical position to mine, just left of the tower's base. However, there is one massive difference I immediately notice. The fuck? The remains of a massive fire pit, like that of a bonfire around 50 feet from her tower. Surrounded by stones, it looks like it looks like one that someone has gotten good use out of. Considering her job is to make sure that there are no fires at all in the woods, that's a bit fucking strange, isn't it? I make my way up to the tower. I'm relatively quiet as I do so, partly because I don't want her thinking I'm the smiling lady running up her stairs, but mostly because I'm nervous. Upon reaching the top, I can already see the tower has nobody in it. In fact, it looks like it never has it, it looks like it never had anyone in it. It has old nests along the top of it, old spider webs along the banisters, and dust literally everywhere. I go to open the door. It's locked. That's weird. My tower doesn't even have a lock. I peer through the glass, squinting to see through the thick layer of dust on the inside of the window. It's dark. Darker than it should be in there. I can make out the main radio on a table next to a stack of what looks like newspapers and files. The bed messy, unkept. There's a bag peeking out from under the bed. I'm guessing it's her rucksack. From what I can see, there are no books, no decks of cards, nothing to keep her occupied during the day. How does she stay sane? I decide to radio her. I've not trekked all this way to not meet her. Pick up my radio. Allison, come in. Hey, a fast reply. What's up, Oscar? Hey, just wondering, I say, as I decide to investigate a bit before letting her know I'm here. Whereabouts are you? I'm in my tower. Why? She replies. Uh, what the fuck? I'm certain that this is the right tower. This is her tower. I'm looking into it and nobody's there. She's lying to me. Uh, it's nothing. I lie, trying to mask my trembling voice behind one of confidence. Just some campers at the edge of my zone. I'll deal with them. No reply. Does she buy it? Does she believe me? Reply, Allison. I need to know if you believe me or not. Cool. Nice one, Oscar. Thanks for that. Okay, thank fuck. She believes me, I think. I decide to head down the tower and hide behind a tree nearby. I wanted to scope this out. 
Maybe she was just heading back to the tower, so she said she was there already. It could just be a misunderstanding, so I'm going to scope, up, scope the situation out and see what happens. It's been over 30 minutes. There's not been any sign of her, or any sign of anything. In fact, this area is completely quiet. Completely dead. Where's the rustle of animals, the sound of distant hikers? It's so quiet. Too quiet. During the wait, I had told myself that if she doesn't come back soon, I was going to break into her tower. I have no idea if that's illegal or not, it's technically the property of my employer, right? I'm guessing it is illegal, but I need to investigate, and I need to do it soon, before it gets dark. Dude, I think... I think my little theory with Allison being the smiling woman... I think, I think it might be true, I don't know. <laughs> I hit the I hit, ugh. I hit the door with the butt of my machete just above the doorknob. The loud bang breaks the eerie silence, followed by the creak of the door as it swings open, freezing me for a second as I wait for something to happen. Nothing. I head inside. Dust hits me and I hold myself back from coughing. I need to be quiet and I need to be fast. The inside of the hut is cold. Weirdly colder than the temperature outside. I walk over to the stacks of newspapers and files. The headline for the first newspaper I see gives me chills. Sister Hikers Missing. Wait. Has Allison been missing this whole time? I skim the article. It's these woods. Two sisters. Missing. Was this Allison's sister? She only told me she had one sister missing. Was she the other one? This doesn't make sense. I flick through the rest of the newspapers, most just reiterating that two sisters were still missing. She said she, she said how she was looking for her sister. Yeah! Until one sister found after being missing for three weeks. The article stated that one of the sisters had been found alive and well, but the other was still missing. It said that they were separated after getting lost in the woods. Allison hadn't mentioned that she had also gotten lost if this was about her. Did she consider that too personal? Or did she lie? I turn my attention to the files. Inside, one piece of paper. It's headlined, Oscar. What the fuck? Under it, information about me. Information I had shared with her about my divorce and why I took the job, my age, what I look like. Maybe she kept these just so she wouldn't forget? An odd way of trying to be friendly? Wait, how does she know that? We've never met. How does she know what I look like? Something fucking weird is going on here. I turn my attention to the bag under the bed. It's a big rucksack, dark blue. I pull it out and open it up. Inside, clothes. They look like male clothes. T-shirts, hiking pants, a rain jacket. I dig deeper. I find a hammer and then a wrench. Nothing too out of the ordinary there. The next item I take out, a pair of sunglasses. Ingrained on the side, R.S. <gasps> Dude! Rick! Rick! Initials? Definitely not Allison's, but somebody's. It's Rick! That, those are Rick's sunglasses! I reach my hand into the bottom of the bag and feel a small metallic object. I lift it out and it's a pocket knife. It's a very nice knife. Looks like something that someone has personally designed. It's got a golden outline, and laced through it is a mix of wavy silver and black designs. There's something ingrained on this, too, in very small letters. To my love, to you, Harvey. What the fuck? Why did she have Harvey's knife? Is this his stuff? Is this where his stuff went after he disappeared? I'm not taking anything, she'll know I was here. But I'm getting out of here, I don't feel safe. As I stand to leave, I hear a familiar voice behind me. Allison's voice. You know, all she wants is to make you smile. <gasps> Fuck, dude! I spin around. Behind me, a woman stands between me and the door. She is slightly shorter than me with messy, unwashed blonde hair which expels out at all angles. Her clothes, long, light brown hiking pants, ruined by old dirt and stains. Similarly, her red checkered shirt looks like it's seen better days. Wrinkled, dirty, a rip stemming from one end of her sleeves. Her face, normal, or at least human. 
The bright blue irises of her eyes provided a direct contrast to their red, bloodshot surroundings. She looks like she hasn't slept in weeks. Her frenzied eyes screaming insanity, looking at me manically with her hands drooped by her side. Her frail body is one of malnourishment, one of abandonment. Uh, Allison, I stammer. What do you mean she wants to make me smile? She just wants you to smile, Allison replied, still staring at me with a crazed look in her eyes. Right, Allison, what is going on? I try to act confident. Are you okay? Allison moves towards the bed. I circle around the hut as she does so. I'm now by the door. A good start. She sits down on the bed and looks down at the dusty floor. I see a tear run down her face. This is a broken woman. We... We went missing, Allison gulped. Both of us. And I got saved, and she didn't. I couldn't tell them what I did, but... But it was bad, and now she's... She trailed off. What did you do, Allison? I'm ready to reach for my machete at any moment. We got lost, and we were lost for so long. She kept telling me, it's okay, it's going to be okay, Allison. They'll find us, Allison. But they didn't. For so long. And I got so hungry. She was always so positive, always smiling, but food, we couldn't catch anything, nothing worked. We tried, Oscar, I promise we tried, Allison said, her voice straining. Did she eat her? Did she eat her sister? Okay, okay, Allison, I know you tried, what happened? She looked up, I jumped, but she only continued to speak. She was looking at me, smiling, when I pushed her. I pushed her far, off the side. It was a moment of weakness, a moment of hunger. She fell so far, her arms, they cracked. She wasn't moving. I was so hungry. She looked back to the ground. She died how she lived, smiling. My stomach churned. She killed her own fucking sister. I've heard hunger makes you do crazy things, but... And it, uh, I've heard hunger makes you do crazy things. I've heard it makes you do anything for food. But after I pushed her, I just, I couldn't do it. She looked up at me once more, tears welling in her otherwise frantic eyes. And the next day they found me. My stomach dropped. They found her only a day after that. Whilst I was scared of her, I felt a sense of sympathy for Allison. I couldn't live with that. A moment of madness defining my life forever. And for what? for literally nothing. And then she found me, Allison whispered as she looked back to the ground, another tear rolling down her cheek. Who found you? I asked, hoping it wasn't who I think she'll say, my blood frozen. My sister, still smiling, still hungry, Allison murmured. She's taking revenge on me, and she's taking revenge on you, Allison stood up and looked back at me, on all of you. I took a small step back, backing out of the hut, not taking my eyes off of Allison. W what have I done? I ask. She blames you all. You couldn't find her. It's your job, our job, to, to find her. Instead, she found me, and I won't lose her again. Allison starts walking slowly towards me. Allison, I didn't even fucking work here. I, I had never even been to these woods. I'm starting to panic as I take steps back. Allison, we can get you help. We can get you out. She gets hungrier every time. She's never satisfied anymore. There is no getting out. As she said this, I knew why the surrounding woods were so quiet. Harvey even worked out the ten rules, and she still got to him eventually. The rules not even I can work out. Allison, for the first time, starts to smile. And Oscar, she's so hungry now. She lunges at me with a sudden sharp screech, arms outstretched. Her weak frame is easy to overpower. I roll her to the side, and with a swift movement, push her away from me. She stumbles, and her foot slides up the side of the balcony. She loses, ba she loses her balance, hitting the wooden floor with a thud before falling from the side of the tower. It all happened so fast. I fell to the floor as I push her, mostly out of shock. I hear her hit something on the way down, probably the steps, followed by a solid thud as she meets the ground below. She didn't scream once as she fell. Holy fuck. I just killed her. Holy fucking fuck. I scrambled to my feet and rushed down the stairs, hoping she's not dead. When I reach the bottom, I see her lying around ten feet from the tower's base, face down, arms broken, twisted. 
a small pool of blood oozing from her head and feeding the soil below, unmoving. I'm running back to my tower, stopping briefly only when the exhaustion takes over. I should be able to get there before it's dark. Fuck this, I'm getting out of these woods. Allison's fucking insane, she attacked me. It was self-defense, she's fucking insane. Something she said is really sticking with me. Harvey worked out the tin rules on the sheet that I know- on the sheet that I know was written by Harvey, there were only nine. What was the tenth rule? This- this at least explains how, how, how Harvey survived for so long, a year. The poor man before him, Rick, who I now suspect owned the sunglasses in Allison's hut, only survived a week. But Harvey had nine rules, nine ways the smiling lady can get you and how to avoid her. I'm not sticking around to find out- to find out what about the tenth is. I'm not sticking around to find out what the tenth is. I'm getting out of these woods. I'm still running back. I can feel someone watching me. I see my tower. It's almost dark. I don't know how the fuck I'm going to get to my car and I don't want to be walking these woods at night. So, I've decided I'm going to sleep at the bunker. I figure that's where Harvey spent his nights when he wasn't at the tower. I figure that's key to how he survived for so long and it's even saved me in the past. I'm going to run up to my tower, grab my main rucksack, and go to the bunker. I'm on the verge of passing out from dehydration, so I'm in need of more water, which is also up in my tower. I'll grab my things and go, in and out. I'm in my tower. I frantically gather my things. I turn to leave. I hear something. It's faint, easy to miss, but it's there. I hold my breath and stop moving, listening for what the sound is. Long, slow, quiet sounds. I hear scratching. Rule 7. If you hear any scratching at any point, either on your hut or by the outhouse, turn off all radios and hide under your covers until the scratching stops. You're fucking kidding me. She knows. She knows I'm trying to leave. I'm frozen in place, hoping the scratching will stop, knowing that if it doesn't, I'll have to follow the rules. I turn to my radio. Over it, in the woods directly below, I see a pale white face looking up at me. The, s the same stringy, dark hair dangling from her head. The same wide, sinister smile plastered across her face. Her white skin illuminated by the surrounding darkness. I see none of her body, just her face emerging from the black of night. She's looking up at me, her excited eyes locked with mine. She knows I'm trying to escape. I have to spend one last night here, and I feel like she's going to do everything she can to get me. I break our gaze and turn the radios off before jumping under my covers. What Allison said to me is ringing in my mind. She's so hungry now. The scratching stops shortly after I go under my covers. I can literally feel her hunger in the air, looming above my tower, focusing in on me. I peek from my bed once I'm certain that the scratching noises have stopped. I don't want her to catch me off guard. I want to be ready for anything she throws at me. I stand up and circle and circle around the balcony of my hut, scanning the surrounding area. Where she stood before, she no longer does. I knew she was fast. Previously, she had beaten me back to my tower when I found her crying in the woods. She could be anywhere. I turn to walk back into my hut. I'm looking out one of the windows as the reflection of the dull lamp starts to flicker behind me. Shit. Rule 4. At night, always sleep with your lamp on. If it starts to flicker, quickly run to turn on your main light until morning. If your lamp flickers off completely before you can do this, hide under your bed until morning. My eyes adjust as I look at the reflection of the lamp, and she's there, right in front of me, through the glass, standing on my balcony. It's her, her broken arms distended, her straggly hair wet, her eyes large, her smile wide. Rule 6. If you wake up and see the smiling woman staring at you through your window, hide under your covers and hold your breath. She will, come into, she will come into your hut, and you will feel her breathing right above you as if she is hovering over you. Do not breathe. This will only last a few seconds. Once you feel her leave, turn on the main light until morning. The lamp flickers once more, then shuts off, plunging me into darkness. I have two rules that I need to follow, two conflicting rules. I can't look away from her, but I know I have to turn on the main light. Her neck suddenly snaps to the side, and she starts to walk fast. I mean fast, stomping loud with each step as she makes her way around the balcony towards the door on the other side. Oh fuck. I turn and sprint to the main light. 
She's about halfway to the door when I turn it on, and now I have to decide whether I hide under the, under the bed or under the covers. I choose the covers. Rule 6 specified she will come into your hut, and she's about to do that. I run toward my bed and pull the covers over my eyes. As I do so, I hear the, hut, I hear the door of my hut open. I hear her loud, fast footsteps charging toward me, but I only see darkness now I lay beneath the thick covers. I hold my breath. I, I hold my breath. I can feel her, just as the rule said I would. She's right above me. I feel her breath. It's cold. My eyes are shut, but I know she's there. I'm trying to hold my breath. My heart is pounding out of my chest. My stomach is churning in fear, but I refuse to breathe. Yet she waits, desperate for me to do so. What happens if I breathe? Will she kill me here and now? Will she possess me? My chest hurts. I can't hold it for much longer. She can sense it. She senses I'm struggling. Her exasperated breaths are getting more and more excitable. I feel her hair dangling either side of me from above the covers, wet. I can't do it. I need to breathe. This is it. I'm fucked. My mouth opens. She's gone. She just vanished. I hold on for three or four seconds more, as long as I physically can, before coughing and gasping for air. But she's gone. No more cold breath, no more presence. I was alone again. I peel back the covers. My hut's door is wide open, swinging in the wind. My main light is still on, as is my lamp once more. Did she use the flickering of the lamp as an attempt to try to get me to fuck up? To choose the wrong rule? If I had chosen to hide under the bed, would she have killed me? It's been quiet for a few hours. My main light is still on, so is my lamp. I feel slightly safer, but I think that's her game plan, to lure me into a false sense of security. I'm not letting my guard down, and thank fuck I didn't. I see a fucking campfire, right by my tower. The glare of all the light from the hut makes it harder to see, but I see it. In fact, I see more than one. There are campfires all around my tower. I walk around the balcony's edge. I count six fires. By each fire, there are dark human figures with their backs turned to me. What the fuck? They're all standing, one per fire, looking into it. The figures are of different sizes. One looks like a child. I can't make out any specific features in the darkness, just their shapes. By the sixth fire, there is no figure. Why is there no figure there? Just as my eyes start to adjust to the darkness below, the figures begin to fall into their fires, one by one. The first to fall into its fire resembles a man. The figure is tall and skinny. He drops face first into the, into the flames, almost willingly. As he squirms, the flames engulf him, making it impossible to make out any of his features. His screams pierce the air. As I stare in horror, another figure, a woman, then falls into her fire. She screams as the flames cover her, writhing in the fire, but she does not attempt to escape it. Next, the smallest figure, the figure of a child, a boy. As he falls face down into the fire, I gasp. I can't bring myself to scream, my whole body is in shock. The child is silent, but twitching violently as the fire burns him. Fourth, the largest silhouette, a wide, sturdy shape of a large man. That's probably, um, what's his name? The big dude that wrote the rules. He falls into his fire, grunting in pain, holding back screams, but barely moving as he burns. Lastly, the shape of a woman. I turn to her before she falls. I need to see. I run inside, grab my flashlight, and run back to where I stood before. As she falls into her fire, I shine it upon her, catching only a glimpse of her messy blonde hair and red checkered shirt rip along its sleeve before the flames take over. Allison. There is just one fire left burning. The sixth fire. The fire with no figure by it. That's yours, dude. As the screams of those below me echo into the night, I hear the faint sound of a woman crying, somewhere in the trees below. Oscar, a voice calls out just as the first rays of sun peek through the trees. Oscar, are you there? I run to the balcony, albeit cautious, and see Sam, Mark's daughter, standing below. She's in the same clothes as the last time I saw her. Sam, I yell. Sam, we have to get out of here. There- Oscar, she shouts, she shouts back. Oscar, I know. I know everything. About Allison, about her sister, 
I know about Harvey and his family, about Rick. I know everything. We have to get out of here, Sam. We can't, Oscar, she cries out. We have to burn her. We have to burn Allison's sister. Why the fuck do we have to burn her, I scream. That's rule 10, Oscar. She's going to follow you, no matter where you go. If you leave this place, she'll be a step behind you forever, unless you burn her. That's rule 10. Find her body and burn it. Rule 10. Burn her body, or she will chase you forever. How the fuck are we supposed to find her body? I shout, defeated. I know where it is, Oscar. Sam smiles warmly in an attempt to calm me. Let me explain everything on the way. It's nearby. I've survived all the other rules. Now I just need to survive one more. I grab my machete. It makes sense that the smiling lady follows you out of the woods. That's why Harvey couldn't leave, and that's why neither could Allison. That's why Allison said there's no getting out, because there isn't. Unless we burn her. And Sam? Allison said Mark didn't have a daughter, but was that just to throw me off? To turn me against a potential ally? Either way, I don't fully trust Sam, not by a long shot. Definitely not until I hear what she has to say. So, I grab my machete. I edge down the steps, approaching Sam. She's looking at me. Her eyes dart to the machete, but she seems like she understands my caution. <gasps> Thank you for the photo. Why didn't you tell me all this before? I ask. If you know everything, why didn't you tell me when we first met? I didn't know who to trust, Oscar, Sam explains. I had known Harvey, and we trusted nobody, not fully, except each other. And Harvey's dead now. I'm, sol I'm solemn with my words. How did you know him? Yes, she looks down. He is. That was confirmed last night. I struck up a friendship with him when he worked here. I bring him extra food and take runs just to see him. That's why I'm in these woods now. I was looking for him. But after last night, it's clear. Yeah, he's dead. How is it confirmed last night, I ask. She seems genuinely heartbroken. The lady, the smiling lady, she seems to, she seems to focus on one victim at a time. While she's hunting someone, it seems like she ignores everyone else. That's why Allison kept feeding her people, so that her sister wouldn't turn on her, Sam explains. My breathing is heavy, my heart racing. She carries on. Last night, I was out looking for Harvey, as I've been doing. I saw the fires around your tower, and I saw those figures falling into them. People she's taken. One of those figures resembled Harvey, and some of the others his family. I saw the sixth fire, the one she made for you, and I heard her crying to try to lure you out. She focuses on her prey one at a time, which confirms that you're her target. She's already got Harvey. She never gives up on her prey until she gets them. And it's you now. You have to burn her. But, but I killed Allison, not her. I, I pushed her when she attacked me, so why did I see her fall into a fire last night? I'm shaking. I hadn't actually said aloud that I'd killed her before. Yes, I thought you might have. Smiling Lady wouldn't have attacked her while she was focused on you. But it doesn't mean that since Allison's death, the Smiling Lady hasn't taken her. Hasn't eaten her. She's always hungry. It's all she cares about. What, why, why don't you just... Burn her fucking body, I shout. This is fucked up. I'm desperate for a way out of this nightmare. It has to be you. It has to be the one she's hunting. I fucking tried, but I only found her body after Harvey disappeared. Whenever I try to burn it, the flames won't light. I don't fucking understand it, but I know it has to be you. She lit a fire for you last night, and it has to be you who lights hers. How the fuck can I trust you? Tears rolling down my cheeks. It made sense why she was looking for Harvey. She needed him to burn her body. Sam pleads, I hid in a bunker last night. That's why I'm here so early. It was Harvey's bunker, Oscar. The smiling lady the smiling lady doesn't know about it. That's how he survived so long. I can show you where it is if you know where it is, I whisper. I have no choice. I have to trust her. I have to burn the body. I quickly go upstairs and grab my backpack. In it, I put my lighter and a canister of kerosene. I'm going to follow Sam, but I'm not letting go of my machete. Of course it's in a fucking cave. On the way, Sam explained that after being pushed, Allison's sister had crawled here in an attempt to find shelter, but had succumbed to her injuries within the cave. She explained that's why I may have seen her crawling, because the smiling lady is replaying her final moments on a loop, which drives her hate. That also explained why she's always smiling. Allison said she was smiling when she pushed her. As Sam stands by the cave, creviced into the side of a steep hill, I shine my flashlight into its entrance. 
I don't see much. It's a thin, tunnel-like structure, around 8 feet across, 15 feet tall. There isn't much room to maneuver should we run into any trouble. I can't see far enough into it to see where it ends. We enter the cave. She's near the end of the cave, Sam whispers. There's like a turn at the end, maybe 300 feet inward. We should be safe. I've never seen her ghost in the day before. Sam trails off. She leaves the way. I'm keeping a close eye on her, but that becomes harder the further in we get. Soon, we are enveloped by darkness. The light from our flashlights is all I can see, as we leave the daylight behind us and enter the dark. Sound soon becomes non-existent. Our footsteps and shallow breathing are only company. Almost as if out of nowhere, we met a wall. To the left, a downward slope that takes us deeper into the cave's abyss. Why, why the fuck would she go so deep? I whisper. If she was waiting to be, if she was wanting to be rescued, she didn't. Sam's hushed reply. She was at the entrance when she died. Someone moved her further in to protect her. I think Allison. We walk deeper. Ten minutes later, the cave expands. Usually, spending this amount of time in a dark atmosphere means your eyes adjust. However, mine haven't. It's almost as if this is a type of darkness I haven't experienced before, or if the smiling lady had put some weird effect on us. I don't fucking know. I just know that other than the light from my flashlight and Sam's in front of me, I can't see shit. A crack behind me. Quick, snapping crack. My heart jumps, and I spin around to shine my flashlight where the sound originated. I see only legs for a split second, crawling away from me into the darkness from which I came. The bare, dirty calves of what looked like a woman shooting out of sight. Look, someone su something's in here with us, and it's alive. The smiling lady is here. I turn to Sam. She's gone. What the fuck? I'm alone. Sam's flashlight on the ground. What the fuck? Where is she? Do I call out? Fuck, I don't know. I'm going to leave her flashlight. I need one hand to grip my machete. I can't go back. The smiling lady is behind me. I need to find her body and I need to burn it. And I need to help Sam. I shine my flashlight around looking for Sam when I see a backpack leaning against the cave's wall. I carefully move towards it, knowing something is watching me from the darkness. My sweaty palms making the machete more difficult to grip. I'm squeezing it as hard as I can. I get to the backpack, quickly scanning the cave around me with the flashlight, but I see nothing but rock. I turn my attention to the bag's contents. It's already open. It doesn't look like it's been here too long, maybe under a week. I hurriedly go through it. An old tarp, a lighter, and the same small canister of kerosene I had taken. The same type that was provided for me at the tower. Also in the bag, a knife. Same style of knife I had found in Allison's tower, only bigger. The same gold outline with silver and black designs swimming through it. On the knife, ingrained, your pair of knives, our pair of hearts, my Harvey. Another one of Harvey's knives. This is Harvey's bag. I flick the knife open, recently used. Its previously sharp edge, now blunt, stained with the, remain with the remnants of stone. I shine my flashlight on the wall the bag lent against, writing scratched into the rock face. Ten Sam lies. Cracking behind me, I spin around and see Sam. She's smiling. Sam, I start. Her eyes are locked with mine. She sees me through the darkness. Her arms start to break, almost as if being broken by the air around them. They snap with jolting movements. Her elbows bend backwards as her bones jut out, hugging the skin under her forearms. With every crack, her smile grows wider. Soon, it is unnaturally sprawled across her face, her eyes wide with glee. Her skin grows wider, her hair longer. She is now unrecognizable as Sam. I now knew her as the Smiling Lady. Oh, rule ten is that Sam lies. Look. I've fallen for it, just as Harvey had. She needs the darkness, that's why she- that's why she roams at night. That's why I felt I was being watched as I left Allison's t Allison's tower. I was, but she couldn't do anything as it wasn't dark. She watched me as Sam during the day, but attacked me as a smiling lady during the night. That note in Allison's tower, explaining what I look like. Only Sam had seen me before then. Fuck, I feel so fucking stupid. I was safe from her in the daylight, but it's dark now, and she's changing. 
She died in the dark, and now she lives in the dark. I stand up, my machete shaking in my hand. I edge toward her. I'm ready to strike. In an explosion of movement on either side of me, I am grabbed. The creatures crawl at me as I feel their bony hands and arms dragging me down. I count five of them as I struggle against their grip. There are too many. They are too strong. My flashlight has fallen from my grip and now shines in my direction. I make out the faces of my attackers. Harvey, his wife, his child, a tall man, Rick, and Allison. They hold me down, Allison's broken arms cutting me as I struggle, her shattered bones sharp. As they all pin me ag against the ground, they smile. I catch a glimpse of Sam as she lunges out of the darkness and bites into my chest. A new man lives in my tower now. He has a family, a dog too, who visit him. We only leave the darkness when she tells us to. She doesn't want to lose us. I smile now. And when she tells me to burn, I burn too. I am, war I am writing this to warn you of the smiling lady in the woods. Do not try to find me. This will be the last time I speak to you all. Do not come looking for me. I belong to her now, and she will never lose me. That's it. That's it. That's the, that's the end of the story. <laughs> that was really fucking good. Holy shit. Wholesome ending. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you for all the gifted subs. I really, really appreciate it. Um, we only have two more goals to look at. Um, we only have two more goals to hit. So I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about that. <laughs> but, um, yeah. I hope you have fellow greetings. <gasps> hello, hello. Also, if you're lurking and if you want to follow me, please feel free to drop a follow either now or, um, Whenever I'm offline, whichever you, whichever you're more comfortable with, and um, make sure to join my Discord server where you can get um, all of my notifications, including whenever I go live on Twitch and whenever I post a video on YouTube. Okay. Um. What else? We hang out there too. I have a Twitter, and I have a YouTube where I post clips, clip compilations, stream highlights, song covers, dance videos, all that fun stuff. Um, yeah. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Adios, bye! So, me wa akete Oh, hiya. Oh, hiya gozaimasu. Watashi no koto ga wakaru kai? Watashi no sekkei sha desu. Systeme ni ijo wa nai yo da ne. Mondai yarimasen. So, itte gora. Omae no namae no.